Good afternoon. I'm Leslie Dana, co-chair MLK Saratoga, along with my other co-chairs Garland Nelson and Holiday Hammond. We are absolutely delighted to have you share today's celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we are also extraordinarily excited to uh, introduce our keynote speaker to you, Loretta J. Ross. Loretta J. Ross is an associate professor at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts in the program for the study of women and gender studies. She teaches courses on white supremacy, human rights, and calling in the calling out culture. She has taught at Hampshire College and Arizona State University. She's a graduate of Agnes Scott College and serves as a consultant for Smith College, collecting oral histories of feminists of color for the Sophia Smith Collection, which also contains her own personal archives. Loretta's activism began when she was tear gassed at a demonstration as a first year student at, at Howard University in 1970. As a teenager, she was involved in anti-apartheid and anti-gentrification activism in Washington, D.C. as a founding member of the D.C. Study Group as part of a 50-year history in social justice activism until her retirement from community organizing in 2012. She was the national coordinator of the Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective from 2005 to 2012 and co-created the theory of reproductive justice in 1994. Loretta was national co-director co of April 24th, excuse me, of April 25th, 2004, March for Women's Lives in Washington, D.C., the largest protest march in the United States history at that time with 115 million participants. She founded the National Center for Human Rights Education in Atlanta, Georgia, from 1996 to 2004. She launched the Women of Color program for the National Organization for Women, now, in the 1980s, and was the national program director of the National Black Women's Health Project. Loretta was one of the first African-American women to direct a rape crisis center in the 1970s, launching her career by pioneering work on violence against women as the third executive director of the DC Rape Crisis Center. She is a member of the Women's Media Center's Progressive Women's Voices. Loretta has co-written three books on reproductive justice, and her newest book, Calling In the Calling Out Culture, is coming out later this year. MLK Saratoga is blessed and so excited to welcome Professor Loretta J. Ross to our Dr. King community celebration. Welcome.
people are mining our personal information so that they can make money over the Internet. And when Dr. King asked us to build a human rights movement in 1968, I think we missed that memo. And so a lot of Reverend Vivian and, and Sheila McTurnett, who's a gift of divine and Israeli Jewish woman, and Rev, uh, the law professor Abdullah Abdullahim, who's a Muslim from the Sudan, we formed the National Center for Human Rights Education in 1996 and spent a decade teaching the American public what their human rights are. Because once Reverend Vivian told me about Dr. King talking about human rights, and I didn't know it. I thought as an activist there were a whole lot of people that didn't know it. And I bet you a lot of the y'all on this call didn't know that we had eight, maybe nine categories of human rights to which we are entitled. So that's why I never give a speech without talking about knowing your human rights because you can't fight for rights you don't know you have. I think giving people knowledge of their human rights is the most radical, revolutionary thing I can imagine doing with my life. I just love doing it. And so my three main points of my speech are, first of all, we need to be prepared for the long haul. I know when I was an activist at 16 and getting tear gassed, I thought the revolution would be to my ear and words of Dr. King in a different way instead of organizing in the identity silos that we've used in the past as we did to build the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the gay and lesbian movement, the environmental movement, the movement against fascism, et cetera. We have a chance to live Dr. real dream to build a united human rights movement, respected for women's rights, racial justice, fighting anti-Semitism, disability rights, immigrant rights, gay rights, et cetera. We have the opportunity to do that has never been done before, which is a, a unified human rights movement. And that opportunity is for us is to make the 21st century the century of peace and human rights, like the 20th century was the century of war, and the 19th century was the century of white supremacy. We have a chance to do a reset. And we don't have to be perfect people because the movement is not perfect. And I find that if you can't forgive yourself for your mistakes as you're trying to do this work, then you won't be able to forgive others for the mistakes that they make. And something I always tell young people is learn to forgive yourself for your mistakes now because trust me, you'll make bigger and better ones in the future. And you have to be able to give, forgive yourself. And so I'm going to close by saying that I am teaching an online class starting tomorrow, calling people in. You can find it out at my website, LorettaRoss.com or LorettaJRoss.com. That leads you to the same place. And uh, thank you for listening to me. And I want to open it up for your questions and your discussions. Again, I'm honored to have been here. Thank you kindly, Professor Ross. I wish you could hear all the all the expressions and we could share in applauding and it's hard with this uh, digital stuff to get the uh, the spidey sense back of everybody's um, experience. We're, we're back here in control room chuckling and sighing and really feeling it and we're just delighted. I'm going to, um, Holly Hammond is going to help us with a Q&A. Folks, uh, there is a, a Q and A uh, box at the bottom of your screens where you could you could write in uh, a question, and Holly's going to direct that over to Professor Ross. Uh, so, and as we go through, I'm going to try to jump in and uh, start videos on people. It's kind of a one by one thing. Holly, you have a question? Yeah, jump in. So tell me a little bit more about the class that you are starting this this week, and is it open to the full public? Uh, the class is open to the full public. It's only five dollars a lecture series. It's a four part lecture series, so you get the whole thing for twenty dollars, about the price of two cups of coffee. And you can learn about calling in techniques, and you can register on my website. I started this class because of COVID. 
because the summer uh, last summer people were asking me whether or not they could attend my Smith classes. Of course, attending a class of Smith cost many thousands and thousands of dollars. And so I was wondering how to make what I was offering more accessible. So some of the young students from my class and from my community taught me how to use Zoom and taught me how to put online two classes, one on calling in the calling out culture and a second one on white supremacy in the age of Trump. And they're all available through my website for $5 a lecture. You can sign up for as many or as few as you want. I really insist on making it accessible to people because I'm not doing it because I'm depending on it for my retirement. I'm doing it because I think we need to democratize this information for people who can't afford to enroll in Smith College or those big institutions. So all are welcome. I'm gonna make sure that we get that up on our website uh, right after today's event. And I will have a, um, I will open a page, Raves and References. And we will put that link right at the very top after I go find it. Thank you. It's just LorettaRoss.com online classes. There it is right there. There it is. There it is. Thank you for welcoming us all in on that. Uh, yeah, I'm going to mute out and Holly's going to jump in. Thank you. Thank you. I keep trying to move a little bit so that you don't get the glare in the back of my head. It's so bright and sunny in Atlanta. I don't want to feel like I'm bragging. <laughs> yeah, th thank you. <laughs> um, so we have a question. Georgiana asks, can you give us an example of what calling in looks like? Well, calling in is a call out done with love and respect to seek accountability. So you're still going to hold the person accountable for what you what they did wrong or even just what you think is wrong, because they don't actually have to be have actually have done something wrong for them to be called out. You know, sometimes they just misspoke or something. And so instead of putting them on full blast and jumping down their throats, oh, when you use that word or when you said that or when you misgendered me, you can stop and say, you know, when you use that word, I'm not sure if I heard exactly what you meant. Do you mind if we go have coffee and talk about it? Or I'm sorry, I think you misgendered me. And sometimes I misgender myself. Would you like us to talk about it? so that we can you know, figure out what, how we can work on this together in the future. It works on the assumption that the other person's human rights matter as much as yours. It also works on the assumption that people are as complicated as you are. And so we are all capable of being what I call a victimized violator, someone who's able to violate someone else's human rights even at the same time, our human rights are being violated. So think of a black person who's being homophobic or a trans person who's being misogynist or an immigrant who's being anti-Semitic. I mean, all of these are capable of existing at the same time. And so I teach the techniques of calling in. It's not that deep because I learned these from the, the shoulders of the people I stood on. Like I said, I started off quoting Reverend Lowry, you don't have no idea how the civil rights leaders fought behind closed doors and then presented a united front when it came time to take on the segregationists. Back in the 70s, we used to call it trashing in the women's movement. We didn't have this term called calling out. But it's simple. Sometimes that phrase, I beg your pardon, is enough. Just let that stay there while the person rethinks in their own head, what they said, and back up and try to offer their idea in a different way. Now, I teach how you can create group calling in guidelines, how you can interrupt a call out, how you can actually, what are the steps of holding people accountable with love? All of those are to be discussed in my class. Thank you. Um... Another question, can you elaborate more on determining the difference between the opponent and the problematic ally? Is there a concrete example of someone who was called out that should have been called in recently? Someone who was called out who should have been called in. Well, I think that's subjective for everybody, but okay, I'm gonna get Frank. 
I am a feminist. I started my life's work working to end violence against women. I have to honestly say that if they put Bill Cosby shows on TV, I'd be watching them right now because I want to call in his other cast members. I don't want to cancel them trying to cancel him. You see what I'm saying? And even then, I'd like to have a conversation with Brother Bill and say, what's up with that? <laughs> you know, because you obviously have cognitive dissonance. And how can we align your exterior present presentation with your inner self? Where is the disjunction happening? Um, I find that many of us have these patterns that were established in childhood. However, our family dealt with us when we made mistakes. Those are the same ways we'll deal with others as adults when they make mistakes. So if we were harshly criticized or humiliated and shamed for making a mistake, guess what? That's why the way we think mistakes should be handled in other people. And so we have a choice to break out of those childhood patterns of just immediately jumping down people's throats or embarrassing or humiliating them. And we say, okay, I'm, I'd rather make a different choice. What I found when I was on the internet constantly calling people out is that I didn't like the person I'd become. Uh -huh. That I was meaner than I needed to be. I don't wanna walk through the world blowing up people's lives but I wasn't taking responsibility for it because they were anonymous to me. I couldn't see the evidence of the harm that I was causing. And I chose, and it ain't easy because I played the dozens with the best of them, but I chose to try to live up to what Reverend Vivian was trying to get into my hard head 30 years ago. Uh -huh. And it's a process. I'm an elder. It's not perfect. But I am saying that I don't want to be that ugly person who assumes the worst of people before I offer them grace. And I want to tell a story if I can. After the Charleston massacre at Mother Emanuel Church, a young man whose mother had been killed, Chris Singleton, was interviewed in the newspaper. And one of the things Chris Singleton did quickly was offer forgiveness. And he got a lot of crit criticism because I was like, how can you forgive the man that just killed your mother? Blah, blah, blah. But Chris said, you know, people think forgiveness is weakness or is easy and it's not. But I've decided that I'm not going to let that murderer define who I am and how I walk through life. I am not gonna be upset with him forever. So his act of forgiveness was a reclamation of his own strength and dignity. It was not weakness. It was probably one of the hardest things he'd ever done. And, but I say, if this man can forgive somebody for killing their mama, how in the world can you not forgive someone who misspoke or got your gender pronoun wrong or said something that was accidentally bigoted and they don't even know that it was. I mean, we need to get over ourselves because I've had to counsel and work with men who are convicted rapists and I'm a rape survivor. And so I've talked to people who were in the Klan. And so we need to understand that the way to reclaim our strengths from being victims is to not let those dirty fingerprints on our soul determine who we are. Absolutely. Those are um, very compelling examples <laughs> you're giving us. Um, I, we have lots and lots of questions coming in and it's, um, I want to. I offer to stay as long as y'all can tolerate hearing my voice because I'm a professional talker. We would, we, would, I do. <laughs> we would never tire of hearing your voice. Um, so Reverend Bell says, I appreciate your analysis of working with problematic ally and the opponent. This is one of the most critical conversations that we need to have further guidance on. Reverend Dr. King called them the difference between the ignorant and the willful ignorance. Th thank you. Um, so absolutely echoing what you said. Um, lots of nice comments, but I'm gonna try to find more questions. There are lots in the Q and A. Um, 
Well, let me I'll, stop and, 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 and bring up a question that I get asked because I'm on a lot of interviews on TV and stuff. How do you talk to Trump supporters after January 6th is my yeah. most frequently asked question. <laughs> and again, that depends on why were they there. Because if they were there to overthrow our government and, and, and to deny an election, then I'm going to have a different conversation, which probably is going to be a calling out conversation. But if they were there because they thought they were doing the right thing, that they thought somehow, though I have trouble following their rationale, that that was the right thing to do to raise their voice in, in civic protest, you know, maybe they came together to the rally and left and stuff, I may consider a different strategy for them. Because while we have a white supremacist movement in this country, 71 million voters for Trump are not all white supremacists. And that's why we have to have the ability to do more accurate threat assessments, because we can't treat everyone who voted for Trump with the same uh, approach that people who came to that Capitol armed, intention, intending to harm our Congress, intending to overthrow the election and vote, uh, vote and intending to pull a coup on democracy, because they, those were the ones who decided that if democracy isn't controlled by them, they don't want a democracy anymore. They want a dictatorship with them in charge. I call it apartheid, American style, is what they wanted. And so those are the call out people. I ain't trying to call them in because we have to, you know, that make America great slogan. I'm not mad at the slogan. I'm just saying, can't we talk about different definitions of what great America looks like? The great America for me is one of inclusion of compassion, of freedom, of helping each other during COVID, of taking care of each other. The great to you might be only I can be in control. And if not, I'd rather blow it up. So I think that we need to have strategy for understanding, giving people the benefit of the doubt, first of all, and, say, and asking, do you support the overturning of the election? Do you support what happened at the Capitol? And like Maya Angelou said, when they tell you who they are, believe them and plan accordingly. So two, you covered a lot of questions with that. So that was perfect. Um, two came from educators. So one is saying, how can white teachers be better at having these discussions about race, arguing the promise of a purified race? Wow. That, that is what it is. And I'm sorry if the term Nazi offends you, but I'm not ashamed to call you that even if you're ashamed of owning the term. There's a reason we had the Nuremberg trials. There's a reason that people don't want to be called a racist. So if that's your ideology, I keep saying, put on your hood and come out the closet because we'll know what we're dealing with. And this is coming from a teacher yeah, so, responding to a student. Well, obviously, maybe, but you are enabling the harm to your students of color by not taking a stance and teaching the truth. And we do a very poor job in the American educational system of teaching the truth. We really, really do. And I see it all the time in my white supremacy class at Smith. By the time these 18 year olds get to college and I start teaching them about the, the Native American genocide and the enslavement and all of that, you know what they do? They get angry that they weren't taught this stuff before because they deserve the truth. And guess what? They get angry at their parents because they, they've lost trust in a trusted advisor, be the one that tells them the truth. And you can do this in age appropriate ways from K through 12. I've done it as a sex educator, as a human rights educator, as an anti-fascist educator, you can do it K through 12 age appropriately. But I find that teachers like parents have conflicts about these issues themselves. So they don't prioritize learning how to teach them. Now, I wrote an article in the Teaching Tolerance Ma magazine for the Southern Poverty Law Center, which a lot of educators have access to because it's distributed for free. And it's called Speaking Up Without Tearing Down. How do you put calling in practices in the K through 12 classroom? So I would recommend that you can find that article both on my website or by going to teachingtolerance.org. Well, thank you for that resource. Um, 
people are also commenting on asking about um, these mass protests and um, uh, is there a mode of calling in that applies to mass protest and then a comment locally in some Black Lives Matter protests, a dispute has arisen. Oops, she sent a corrected version of this. Um, has arisen about the tone of the protests. While some feel it is justifiable to jump down people's throats, embarrass, curse, and humiliate opponents and onlookers, others wish for a gentler method of calling people out in our protests. Um, I, don't, I don't try to presume that I can speak to how sub subsequent generations to mine conduct their struggle. Because we're way beyond the we shall overcome days. <laughs> I'm sorry. There has never been an appropriate way for black people to protest white supremacy that doesn't get criticized. Whether it was Colin Kaepernick kneeling to the Black Lives Matter in the street, there is no right way. <laughs> that America right. has shown us that there is no right way. So young people right. need to do what young people need to do. I am a proponent of nonviolence. I think that that's the most effective way because it illustrates how violent the people we're fighting are. But if you start eliminating the difference between us and them, then you let people in the middle act like there's a false equivalence here. And so strategically, I'm a proponent of nonviolence, but I'm not going to be an elder scold on people who said, well, we've tried praying, we've tried kneeling, we've tried writing letters, we've tried writing Black at Harvard. We've tried all of that. And now we have to listen to Dr. King again, who said, well, protests are the voices of the unheard. <laughs> at some point, we have to get people's attention so that we can, as Dr. Vincent Harding say, build a country that has never existed, one that includes all of us. Thank you. This came up at yesterday's, um, we had a community conversation about protest and talked about this very issue about there, there, there's never a right way to protest. People are always being critical and that that becomes a distraction to why people are protesting and the importance of um, building um, relationships with people rather than, you know, staying far away and being critical, moving in and um, building relationships. And that's um, what we're trying to do in Saratoga. So really appreciating um, this conversation right now. Um, I wish, I really wish we could bring people on. Is there, is there a way to do that so that there's more Not interaction? In a webinar fashion. A webinar by definition only has panelists and audience. Only a meeting format in Zoom gives you interactivity. Sure, but I can I can unmute people if they'd like to speak. So I just want to give people that option. If people are wanting to and they raise their hand. Um, let me see. So um, uh, Kristen says, I feel like starting with privilege can be a turnoff. Is there a way to call in while helping someone understand their privilege? Well, privilege by definition is having advantages that you may not have given yourself, but you're also not accountable for. I mean, it's kind of like, I have the privilege of being a person with vision. Am I going to lord it over a, per a child without, who's blind, without vision and say, well, I can see, so why shouldn't there be books in Braille simply because you can? I mean, you see how crazy that is? We need to own our privilege and use it to, to yeah. benefit the people who don't have privilege instead of denying that we get any advantages from the privilege. You know, because I do have an advantage as a sighted person. Nobody can tell you that they don't because the world is designed for sighted people. The same way white supremacy has sculpted America to best benefit white people. Like I said, the white people who are beneficiaries of it didn't create the system, but if they're going to be true to their own integrity, they certainly want to dismantle it or they want to continue to pretend 
that they're the sighted people who don't have to care about the blind people. I am trying, there's a, a hand raised and I'm trying to, and Jen Natizak, I think, can you, can you get, I can't get to the hand. <laughs> oh, can you unmute her or do I have to? Go ahead. Is someone Hello, talking? can you hear me? Yes. Yolanda. Hello, Dr. Ross. How are you? I'm doing great for an old lady. I'm having a ball. <laughs> it's great to see you. <laughs> um, so I teach uh, inequalities in health at Ithaca College. And of course, you already know that there is um, tremendous amount of information that, that says that racism is a public health issue and that we as Black people, particularly Black women, have uh, high levels of something we call allostatic load and something right. that we call non-syndemic, um, non-communicable syndemics like high blood pressure and heart disease and uh, things from the stress of encountering racism on a consistent basis. And so my question for you, um, uh, first of all, how can we best take care of ourselves, particularly with the increasing numbers of students that we're seeing with mental health problems um, and stress and how do we take care of ourselves as caretakers? And how do we encourage more white people to take on this burden of advocacy and give us a time out? Well, first of all, thank you for coming from Ithaca College. I've actually spoken at Ithaca College about 20 or 30 years ago. And the reason that it stands out amongst the many colleges that I've spoken at is that at the same time I was in Ithaca, the chief of police who was there at, their, at the time invited me in to give a whole human rights training to his police department because he wanted policing done through a human rights lens. And that doesn't happen. All right. <laughs> <You know>? Right. <laughs> it stands out in a very memorable way. Well, first of all, Yes, there's a allostatic load with all of the tensions that we bear, but particularly racism, because racism like transphobia and all the things is that pain that you're not allowed to walk away from. Like some days you just wake up and you just want to go to work, go to school, have a good day. And then somebody just takes away your joy by mm -hmm, calling mm -hmm. you a word or assuming with a microaggression, assuming you mm -hmm. shouldn't be at that school or whatever. And so we become so vulnerable to the wounds. And then at the same time, we're constantly being stabbed by these wounds. Mm -hmm. We're admonished by people who don't experience those vulnerabilities by telling us that we should just get over it. Mm -hmm. A wound that's constantly re-stabbed will never heal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. that's what that allostatic load that you're talking about is created by white supremacy. I would also argue, though, that it's stabbing the other way. It's a two-edged knife because I talk to a lot of white people who are brainwashed. They don't know how to distinguish themselves between the Trump supporters or the actual fascists. And they want to start with that all what not all white people thing because and they and then they start using our movement spaces as their publicly therapy labs. So they want to just have all of their feelings mm -hmm. as if that's the work of the movement. The work of the human rights movement is to end oppression, mm -hmm. not provide public therapy space. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so they get confused over that. But I'll just, you know, break it down and make it plain. When I started NOW's Women of Color program in 1985, I spent my first three years there trying to get white women to understand the reality of black women. And I used to get so frustrated at that. I was a call out queen over what I called internalized racism and now. And it suddenly dawned on me that how in the world could they understand the realities of black women when they couldn't even understand the realities of white women. Mm. They didn't even understand how white supremacy 
harms and disables them. So if you can't understand the skin you live in, how can I expect you to My understand mm -hmm. the skin, the skin that you other? <laughs> and so we need to change the project from assuming that we can ever teach them how to be how it is to be a black person and particularly a black woman. I would like to teach them how to be appropriately white, how to reclaim whiteness without white supremacy. And I actually teach that in my course and in the white supremacy class. How do you reclaim a white identity stripped of power and domination and white supremacy? Because as long as white people are ashamed of being white or they weaponize being white, they will never partner with us as effective allies to deconstruct white supremacy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. It's good to hear your voice. Um, <laughs> I hope I'm not talking too theoretically. I try to keep make it plain as I can. But once in a while, I fall into that academic register. So oh, I understand you. I do. <laughs> Yeah, no, we're with you. Um, Terry Diggory is, um, I'm gonna allow you to talk if you'd like to speak. Um, actually, I, the question that I had had to do with um, protest as a mode of calling in and whether whether it was, it was possible. I guess I, um, a, another twist on that question would be um, a lot of the, um, examples of, of calling in uh, that you've given us had to do with personal interaction. Do you, do you think that that's the best mode for, for calling in, that, that it's, it's got to be one-on-one -on -one or small group rather than large group, or is it the whole spectrum? I think it's every spectrum. I was the first Black employee hired at the National Football League Players Association because I'm a football junkie. I'm a feminist who likes bloody contact sports. Get over it. Anyway, <laughs> and, um, and so I happened to, in the 70s, know a lot about the NFLPA, work for a Black union president with an all-white staff and all of that. And so I paid very careful attention to the impact of Colin Kaepernick's kneeling. He called out a whole institution. Now, I'm sure that they thought that when they put those Black Lives Matter, uh, painted those uh, behind the goalposts, the Black Lives Matter signs, that's all the NFL thought that they needed to do some performance or symbolic stuff. But we haven't given up from the days of the 70s when we had to have player strikes so that they could get control of their likenesses and, and make their own corporate deal. This is what racial justice looks like. This is what human rights look like. It takes a long time. But yes, we have to call out institutions. We have to call out corporations. We have to call out Congress people. We have to call out um, our neighbors sometimes. I mean, we have to call out people, Uncle Frank across the Thanksgiving dinner. But I'm just saying that within our toolkit, we should have many options. Try calling in first and offering them a chance to do better before you default to calling out. But when you start with calling people out you, and you've made them feel publicly humiliated or ashamed or embarrassed, guess what? Their listening shuts down because you've attacked what they see as their moral character. And nobody listens once they've been called names. That's just human. And can so you, if you want to be strategic, Try a different strategy and save the calling out as the last resort. Can you call in an institution? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just give you a perfect example. Uh, when I was first hired at one of my colleges that I'll leave unnamed because I'm not trying to call them out, uh, they were bemoaning the fact that one faculty meeting that enough, not enough faculty of color were volunteering to be department chairs because they needed some department chairs. And so I asked one of the, my trusted white women friends, why was that? Why was it so hard to get faculty of color in department chairs? And she literally said to me, well, most of them don't apply. I don't know if they want additional work, she said. I said, wait a moment. I love you as a friend and a comrade, but the way I heard your comment, 
is that you're telling me that faculty of color don't want to work hard. That's basically what you're saying. And so she didn't realize that's how that landed on me, but I reinterpreted for her. And then we had I started having meetings on the invisible burdens that faculty of color are addressing because they're trying to deal with students of color, trying to get an education that has not been properly prepared in an institution that has not been pre properly prepared for them to welcome them and all of that. And that was real that a lot of faculty of color said, they've already, I'm already doing two jobs they're not paying me for. I'm already a counselor instead of, as well as a professor. I'm already dealing with trans students because I'm the only trans professor. I can't take on more. And so it was that invisible labor that needed to be attended to before they could address the department chair question. And so I kind of did a loving call out by reinterpreting what she didn't know she had said. <laughs> That they don't that the faculty of color don't want to take on additional work because she was basically saying they were lazy but not knowing that's what she said mm -hmm. so you can you can take on institutions you it depends but if you want to be strategic and effective i suggest that your first strategy is not to call them out and embarrass them you great great example okay um we have what we're hoping is to continue. We have some, a few other um, brief performances or, oh, you want to keep this? Okay. Okay, so we're going to take a few more questions and then we're going to have an extended Q&A after we close out for people who want to stay on if, if, Ms. Ross is willing to stay with us. Okay, I'll do my best. <laughs> Our next presentation is at six o'clock. So. Oh, we won't, we won't keep you that long. Um, <laughs> Three MLK so, is in one day, but that's, let me, that's a joy and an honor. So um, a couple of people are interested to hear more about the direct anti-Klan work you have done. Okay, well, after more than a decade of working in the women's movement, I got approached by Daniel Levitas, who was the executive director of the Center for Democratic Renewal, which was the new name for the National Anti-Klan Network. Uh, by the way, Center for Democratic Renewal, that's what happens when a bad branding consultant euphemizes <laughs> your name. And for years, people thought that we are wing of the Democratic Party. When we were founded by black people, in 1979, even before the Southern Poverty Law Center was founded to fight the KKK after the Greensboro Massacre of 1979. So anyway, um, I started out as a program director, which is my job was to work with communities that experience hate violence and help them understand how to do anti-Klan activities like prayer services, educational services, peaceful marches, those kinds of things. And there was always a split or splits within the white community when these Klan flyers or literature would be stuffed in, you know, into people's mailboxes or when the hate crime took place. The largest proportion of the white community wanted a don't say nothing, let, let's just ignore it, and they will go away strategy, the ostrich fat strategy, because they didn't want their town branded as being a hotbed of hate. And that's an understandable uh, feeling, though, that the strategy was going to fail, because like any other bullies, when you ignore them, they escalate. They don't just you know, slither off into the darkness. Then there'd always be a smaller, even a much smaller subset of the white response that wanted to meet violence with violence. So when the Klan showed up, then there was always some usually, usually masculine, masculinist impulse to want to fight them, like anti-racist action, wanting to fight the racist kind of thing. And so we didn't think that was a good strategy as well, because whenever the Klan show up, all 12 of them, and then a thousand anti-Klan protesters show up, then they all, the Klan ends up looking like the victims 
in case of violence. And that fits the Klan narrative. And so in the middle of these two ignore or beat them up people were the muddled middle, I call them. That's where the majority of the white folks probably were. They wanted to do something, whether it was about, um, uh, like in, in a town, not in my town, it was in Montana, I think it was, where uh, a Jewish family put a menorah in the window and then a rock was thrown through the window threatening the family and then the newspaper printed a menorah in the newspaper so that every family could put a menorah in their window in solidarity with the Jewish family. So those are the kinds of things I would try to work with local towns on, on how to do something that shows who you are and what your values are without ignoring it or resulting to violence. Now, once my um, research director, Leonard Zeskin retired, he was the one that taught me about fighting fascists should be fun, being a Nazi is what's up. Um, he retired, then I took over his responsibilities as well as my own, so I became the program research director. And at that point, my job was to monitor the hate groups, to issue weekly reports on their, their activities. And this was long before the internet and bulletin boards and all that kind of stuff that we could take for granted now. At the time, there were only a handful of, of organizations that monitored hate groups with the ADL being the biggest and then the Southern Poverty Law Center. But we were one of the few and probably the only one led by black people in the South, particularly or nationally, but we were the only one led by black people. And so my job was to go to Klan demonstrations and take photographs, take notes of what was going on, who was there so that I could write research reports about, okay, here's Glenn Miller from North Carolina appearing at Hayden Lake, Idaho with the Aryan Nations. What does it mean when a Klan's person is up there with the neo-Nazis? Is there a crossover? Are they sharing personnel and ideas uh, and weapons possibly? And then whenever, you know, obviously a, being a lone black woman going to a Klan rally or a neo-Nazi movement was always risky. And so I had this guy, a big, tall white guy who served as my photographer. Matter of fact, I had fake press credentials on. So that was the way that they always thought I worked for CNN or somebody. They never actually looked at the badge too carefully. They, they, they were legitimate credentials because I actually got them from our driver's license uh, bureau where you get your press credentials where it's just that I wasn't working for CNN like they assumed. They, you know, they don't assume the black woman at the Klan rally, she's got to be crazy to work for CNN. <laughs> anyway, but the tall guy <clears throat> that used to accompany me would always have this video camera Big, you know, back when video cameras were the big things you'd had on your shoulders along, but he was actually my security. And uh, a couple of times people thought we were an interracial couple, which was kind of cute, like, no, nope, no, nope, that's not what's happening. But there were times when it felt very dangerous, uh, not because I was ever called the N-word or anything like that, or, you know, I. I think because I was by myself, they didn't feel like I was a threat or anything. I think if there had been a group of black people, they might have been different. And obviously their gender and their race blindness didn't even see a black woman as a threat because they got those, those blinders on as well. But there, in North Georgia, we have a county called Forsyth County. And Forsyth County had decided in the early 1990s that they wanted to diversify. So they wanted to invite people of color to come relocate to Forsyth County. Now you need to know about North Georgia was that after the Civil War, a, a campaign of racial terrorism had taken place that had really depopulated all of North Georgia of black people because of the lynchings and the hate crimes and stuff that took place in most places north of the city of Atlanta. Atlanta's in North Georgia, but everything north was overwhelmingly white because of this, this uh, campaign of terror after the Civil War. And so when the county leaders in Forsyth County decided we needed to diversify, because see, that was the other problem that's happened. 
in the city of Atlanta because of us being kind of like the transportation and commercial hub of the deep south, kind of like the new south. We have the biggest airports. We have the biggest industries located here. We're kind of like southern Silicon Valley. This is Atlanta. This is what the new south represents, so to speak. Well, the, the business leaders of Forsyth County didn't like being left out of all that economic development. And so that's why they wanted to diversify. And so there was a Klan march protesting the attempt to diversify Forsyth County using the slogan, keep Forsyth white. And so that got national attention. Oprah Winfrey came down here and led another multiracial march about integrating Forsyth County that got national news. I know I'm telling too long a story, so let me try to wrap this up. But anyway, so then there was another march by the Klan to protest the Oprah Winfrey march, you know, just going back and forth. And so I was attending this march as a monitor and I was standing near the stage and on the stage were two white men with their backs to me. And as I was overhearing their conversation, it turned out to be the sheriff of Forsyth County, basically telling the head, lead, the leader of the Klan that you're going to be all right because when those other folks get here, we're going to leave. And basically telling the Klansmen that he he was given a they were given a green light to do whatever they wanted to do to the anti-Klan march. And first of all, I felt afraid because that was my proof of the collaboration between law enforcement and the KKK. I mean. We always had written about it. We had always assumed it. We always knew, you know, we had a book called They Don't All Wear Sheets. We knew this was happening, but that was my first personal experience of it. And then something, something alerted to them to the fact that I was standing behind them, hearing their conversation. And so they quickly turned around. And next thing I knew, someone had started snapping my picture. And next thing I know, my, my picture was in a Klan newspaper, which is a singular honor, I guess. Um, and so there were times, that was when I felt most afraid. But on another level, after the April 19th, 1995 bombing in Oklahoma City of the Murrow Building by Timothy McVeigh, one of the things I had done as a researcher was monitor what the hate groups were saying. They used to use uh, dial of hate lines, just like there were dial of prayer lines back in the 1990s. I don't know if anybody remembers these, but you could call a number and you'd get the prayer message of the day. Well, they had dial of hate lines. And so it was our job routinely to monitor these things. And they'd all been talking about, just like they were talking about on the internet today, about storming the Capitol. The, the hate groups back then were talking about April 19th because that was the anniversary of the Ruby, I think it was the Ruby Ridge shootout with the police and all of that, as well as they had educate uh, that the government had executed a white supremacist down in Arkansas and it's only a few days before Hitler's birthday. So we knew there was some congregation of hate happening the week of April 19th. And then when I woke up on that Wednesday morning and heard that the Murrow building had been, been bombed. I rushed into work because I had my research team start putting together all this data we had. And then, you know, by two hours later, the US government was announcing that they were looking for Arab terrorists when I was convinced that this was domestic terrorism. And so on Friday morning at 10 o'clock, I called a press conference to tell them, to just show them the data that I had. The, the recorded hate lines promising something on April 19th, the correlation to what had happened in Ruby Ridge or Waco, I'm, I'm still confusing those two at this moment, and, um, and the execution of this white supremacist in Arkansas and how they'd been chattering about it the same way all these people who had forewarned about the Capitol insurrection were being ignored before it actually happened. And so that was at 10 o'clock that morning and by two o'clock that afternoon, they had arrested Timothy McVeigh and it was shown to be a white supremacist plot. Within a few weeks, my mom and dad at their unlisted phone number where in my hometown, 
had gotten a call inviting them to the meeting of the Texas militia so that they could prove to their daughter that the Texas militia was not a racist organization like I had claimed all militias were. So that's when the threat went from me to my family. And that made me afraid because my parents had not signed up for that. I had signed up for that. But I have to honestly say, uh, my parents have passed now, but I have to honestly say that they totally mis miscalculated about my daddy. My daddy was a 26 year veteran of the army. He was a weapons specialist. So the minute I told dad what was happening, he had populated the signs with Smith and Wesson signs, the yard with Smith and Wesson signs everywhere. <laughs> kind of like, I dare you to come to this house kind of thing. <laughs> but mom was so naive that she kept this guy on the phone for hours telling her my entire life stories so that they gathered intelligence on me from my mom that they couldn't have gotten any way before, before Google. And so that, that was scary. So those were some real experiences. Thank you for sharing those. We, um, Yeah, we're going we're, we're, we're going to transition. We have just a brief. How how long is the? So we're we're going to pause to show the last ten minutes of our program, and then reconvene for people who want to continue this conversation. I a break in that ten minutes. Then, what was that? Take a potty break in those ten minutes. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry to be don't, ask, don't ask a slutty woman what she really meant. <laughs> okay. Thank you. This is remarkable, and we hope all of you can stay with us. Uh, we have a really very, very special uh, piece coming up next from uh, that was commissioned for our weekend here uh, for the Dr. King Celebration Weekend. And I want to introduce from Tango Fusion, local professionals to uh, Saratoga Springs, Johnny Martinez and Diane Lathrop, who have choreographed to a wonderful song, uh, a United State of Humanity, a recent, uh, a, won a national award through Braver Angels Songwriting Contest. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Johnny Martinez and Diane Lathrop. In me. In me. Not black. Not white. Not wrong. It's not right. It's not red. It's not blue. Just me and you. It's not rich. It's not poor. Somewhere in the middle is the open door. If I point up you, don't quite see eye to eye. Well, that's all the more reason why we need a United States of humanity. We need it. We need it. The United States of humanity. The sum of every part. Need a United States of humanity. We need it. We need it. In a revolution of the heart We're living in a great divide This fear of each other is our suicide I believe love's gonna keep us alive But only if we decide We need a United States of humanity We need it State of humanity, the sum of every part. Need a United States of humanity. We need it. We need it. Resolutions in a revolution of the heart. It's not just the conversation, it's the listening. It takes every voice feeling heard to let freedom breathe. We can solve our future, heal our is a 
evolution of the heart. Oh, we hold this truth to be self-evident. I have a dream, a United States of humanity. We need it, we need it. We hold this truth to be self-evident. I have a dream, a United States of humanity. We need it, we need it. A Revolution of resolutions in a revolution of revolutions in a revolution of the.